It's my pleasure, my privilege to uh, be able to introduce Dolores this morning. Dr. Mullings will present on teaching and learning transformation, the dangers of pivoting without critical thought and action. As you will probably know, Dr. Mullings is our Vice Provost for Equity, Diversity, Inclusion and Anti-Racism, our very first Pro Vice Provost uh, for that role. Before and certainly still uh, taking up that role, Dolores is an award-winning professor in the School of Social Work. Her work with students has been recognized with the YWCA Women of Distinction Award for Education and Mentorship. She has been an honoree of the 100 Accomplished Black Canadian Women. She's a recipient of Memorial's President's Award for Outstanding Teaching, and she has previously served as the chair of the Teaching and Learning Committee, or chair of Teaching and Learning, sorry, uh, of the School of Social Work. As a scholar, her interdisciplinary work explores decolonizing post-secondary education, mental health and wellness, LGBTQ plus concerns, the Black church, aging, migration, community engagement, mothering and parenting using critical pedagogies. In particular, her work looks at anti-Black racism, Afrocentric theory, and critical race theory. Dr. Mulling's experience, her expertise, uh, and her abilities are absolutely critical as we, Memorial University, advance our priorities in equity, diversity, inclusion, and anti-racism, cultivating and nurturing diversity, being culturally responsive, and celebrating the beauty of a diverse university population. I'm really excited to hear some of what Dr. Mullings has to say, and I'm sure you all are as well. So please join me in clapping, perhaps with your microphones on mute, to welcome Dr. Dolores <laughs> Mullings. Dr. Mullings, the screen is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Sutherland. Good morning, good morning. Grand rising, some of us will say. Um, it. And welcome to a new day at Memorial University. I am excited and honored to be here with you for our annual teaching and learning conference, one of Memorial University's many community engagement activities that bring together our community members, guests, students, staff, and faculty to explore all things teaching and learning. So I know we've done Dr. Sutherland has done the um, land acknowledgement, but I just want to add to that a little bit and invite you to consider when was the last time you listened to the entire land acknowledgement, whatever it was, without drifting away? And is this different from when you heard it the first few times? And if you can't remember, Try and observe that the next time you're at an, at an event and the land acknowledgement is read. And I'll just leave you with that, just to ponder um, what that might mean if we're drifting away each time we're hearing it today. I also want to acknowledge my African ancestors who survived the Middle Passage and the transatlantic slave trade who were forced into labor which helped to build many nation states in the global north. I honor my people for their will to survive and the tenacity to carve out roads for those of us who would come after them under excruci excruciating conditions. So today I'll be modeling active teaching and learning. So I will ask questions to create space for you to participate throughout the talk there will be a Q&A segment after the talk, followed by small group work, large group sharing, and we will end with Q&A. Let's see how we do with that time. <laughs> um, so throughout the talk, I'll be discussing briefly the impact of COVID-19 and how we navigated through the first wave of the pandemic, barriers to learning and teaching that were exacerbated, and make some suggestions for how we can use critical pedagogy to create rock stars learners, and 21st century graduates. All right, so let's get into our main topic for the morning. All of us here today have had some experience with COVID-19, either directly or vicariously. We have seen devastation with over 6.2 million deaths 
and over 512 million infections worldwide. Within this grim reality, though, we know that more people have beaten COVID with a survival rate of 99.9% for younger people and 94.6% for people over the age of 70. Of course, there are nuances within that. There are particulars to people's circumstances that's going to change the statistics. So here is the first opportunity for interactions to get you in the game. So I'd like for you to, if you're able to put in the chat, how many of you have had or know someone who has had experience with COVID? Yes or no, I think, yeah. Mostly, it, it, it's all yes, pretty much. <laughs> pretty much Mullings, yeah. That's a pretty good batting average. Yeah, some with several, commenting that they've had several, actually. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm, 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 I'm happy that you're all here. I'm uh, sorry to know if you've lost people, if you've had to grieve. Um, but I'm happy that you're here and you're able to contribute to this conversation. So you two have beaten COVID. So re you're within the percentage between 99% and 94.6%. So what did we do during the first wave of COVID? We were asked to hide, stay home, uh, and stay away from each other. And this is where the pivot began. And the Oxford Dictionary defines pivot as they use as a verb or, or a noun. If it's a verb, it turns on or if on a pivot or as a noun, it is the central point, pin or shaft on which a mechanism turns or oscillates. For us, COVID became the central point, pin or shaft on which everything about our lives, including schools and the way we did and still conduct education occur. So I wanna shout out to everyone, especially the teachers who stayed in the game and held everything down and did the heavy lifting to make sure that uh, learners made it through. But before we were invited to pivot, let's look at some of the teaching and learning challenges that have been exacerbated during COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic. And these are things that we knew we had to address before. Now we know it's even more critical to address those things. So here's another time, uh, opportunity for interactions. What are some of your um, challenges and barriers to, in um, teaching and learning? And that could be for you personally, or how you see for student, what you see for students. Community, social, social anxiety, students feel very isolated. Hard to know who's in the audience, who was missing. <laughs> student engagement, se the sense of students. These are all things uh, coming out in the chat, uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Mullins. Mm -hmm. Hard to know who was in the audience, as I said, it's coming out. Mm -hmm. Connection with students, the isolation, tired, stress. Mm -hmm. Ah, students unequal to take uh, access to technology, internet access to support disabilities. Mm -hmm. Tracking down missing students. <laughs> Inequities, yes, Dr. Sullivan. Yeah. yeah. Technological okay. problems. Mm. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much for that contribution. And basically what you've just said is what the literature talks about, all of those things and more. So I'm just going to um, 
uh, pick out some of those things and just talk about. So one of the big things that literature talks about and that you've just shared um, with each other and myself is a lack, it's lots of things around students. And somebody said that they were trying to track down students and that is reflective in a lack of learner motivation. And sometimes what happens is, you know, they show up in a minimalist kind of way. They do only absolutely what's necessary. Um, you know, they don't retain information that you try to um, introduce them to, high absenteeism, lack of participation even when they're there. That means that you as a facilitator of education is exhausted. You're always running behind the students, trying to remind them to submit something or, um, you know, just frustration. And as you say, isolation for yourself because, and for students because of the situation, which has been exacerbated. Another thing is learning challenges for students or learners. And, um, Teachers sounded the alarm um, quite a while ago um, around mental health. I'm just going to pick on this one thing. So teachers who are interacting directly with students sounded the alarm about the uptake in mental health uh, conditions amongst students. And I, it, it was interesting that we didn't sound the alarm about mental health uptake for our faculty. Um, the ones that were at the at the very front lines of everything, but here at Memorial, you know, our president, Dr. Timmons, um, reminded us that we needed to support students. And right across the university, we had, we you know, we have um, a large infrastructure that supported students. So we, while we recognized before COVID that this was happening, we clearly understood that COVID exacerbated these kinds of challenges. And of course, learning challenges come in different kinds of ways, not just mental health. There's also language. There are two levels to language though. One, there's the language for, in our case, um, people who are English language learners. So in some languages, there's no direct translation to some words. So there's that piece, but the other piece of language is the discipline specific language. So for example, in law, you know, the language for people might be offenders or perpetrators or something. Um, in social work, it might be client or participant. And in nursing, it might be patient. So there are universal language for different disciplines that students actually need to learn. And sometimes that is a huge difficulty. There's also social, cultural, and racial challenges, depending on who is at the front of the room, who is facilitating the education, who is in the, uh, who is, uh, who the students or the learners are, that can create some challenges in terms of a lack of understanding of where, you know, people are coming from, a dislocation of people's lived experiences, what they might need in order to succeed in the educational environment. And that can cause, again, frustration and lack of understanding and more misunderstanding. There is the environmental piece, which some of you also talked about. Um, so we had, for the most part, a physical environment. Now we have a virtual environment. There are lots of assumptions around a virtual environment and how it's accessible. I think that's what we were hearing about. Wow, you know, everybody can be a part of, you know, um, this because now we are online and, you know, as someone, uh, one of you said, this is actually not true because there are lots of ways that people are not able to participate in virtual environments because of lots of different things, including lack of access to internet service or poor internet service. From a, in a physical classroom as well, depending on how the room is constructed, how you know, the facilitator, uh, so the teacher facilitator manage the classroom, that can present barriers as well. So we see for the most part, you know, universities, post-secondary education across the world, not just here at MUN or across Canada, you know, it's constructed to have lots of people in the space. So people, students, you know, are looking up 
at the facilitator um, and they're looking at the back of each other. So there is little opportunity to participate or to interact with each other. Um, there's also teaching and learning styles. For the most part, because of how the classrooms are structured, even virtually, um, you know, it's lecture style. The most popular way of helping students to understand uh, information or content is through a lecture. Many students actually do not learn the best um, through lecture styles. But when we have very large groups, those are some of the things we um, revert to. And I'll have some suggestions for what we can do about that. But, you know, students also learn differently. Some people are very visual or verbal. Other people do very well when they get tests and exams that they can just focus, buckle down and focus. But unfortunately, you know, our teaching styles are how we are taught to teach. In fact, most of us who have a PhD were never really taught how to conduct um, our university classes. We've done so on the side by learning, you know, um, in different ways, going to conferences and doing extra things on the side to try and learn. And of course, with the proliferation of literature about how to have better, um, how to deliver better content to help students becoming their best selves, you know, a lot of us have learned um, some different ways. Um, so the final thing I'm going to talk about is the curriculum. That's what's on everybody's lips right now. So part of the critique around the curriculum is pretty standard. Um, it's very Eurocentric. Even when there are people, you know, facilitating education who are not of Eurocentric European background, the the content is not necessarily reflective of the students or the um, the you know, the, uh, yeah, the students in the classroom. And so that is one of the main things that in spite of, regardless of what else we do in terms of trying to support uh, learners in the learning and teaching space, we actually need to be more cognizant of uh, the content. Um, so who's writing, who's constructing the content and um, who is left out? who is not included into this content. So given some of these challenges, most post-secondary institutions are now focused on creating a sense of belonging, particularly among students and to a lesser extent, faculty and staff. And because a lot of universities, because here at Mon, we have a large um, population of international students, not unlike other universities across the country and some uh, the world, um, there is a need to sort of address students not feeling okay in their environment. But what does it mean to feel belonged, safe, and included? And who decides that? How do we get to this place, really? Um, there's lots of literature out there about what we can do and how we can do them. But for me, if we're interested and committed in teaching and learning transformation, it is dangerous for us to consider pivoting inside the same systems. So everything to me, what we've been doing for the most part, and I'm not just talking about MUN, it's right across, you know, the educational, post-secondary educational sector, it's pretty much we're working inside of what with infrastructure and the systems we have, because that's what we have and we need to work inside of them. But be for me, before we can actually move forward, we need to engage in critical thought and action. And that's the only way, for, that's one of the few ways, or that's one of the many ways that we can reach the point of what we're trying to reach. So this means that until we have a cosmopolitan representation amongst all constituents in our university, including at the administrative and at the teacher level, the notion of safety, inclusion, and belonging to me is simply a distant dream. It sounds pessimistic. So why do I say this? Well, when you go into your class the next time or you attend convocation or a town hall, you know, at your university or here at MUN, observe who you see in decision-making positions and measure that against the student body and see what you think. Note also which bodies are in which positions. 
on a cursory glance who appears missing. Now, I know we cannot tell for sure who is missing and who isn't missing just by looking. That's dangerous as well, but some things will become quite obvious quickly. The challenge here is that we cannot have the constant recycling of the same groups of people with minor changes or additions. So this vision that, we, that we're trying to achieve is burial laden because it is questionable if those of us who are trying to make the decisions have the knowledge to lead the endeavor for every single person that is seeking or that we're trying to help to, that, that we're in where we're trying to create an environment where everyone feels included and um, welcome. So what I'm proposing is that the consultation is a good start and we need to continue with consulting um, all constituents, but it cannot be the end vision because then we are still recycling the same thing. We actually need to have bodies in places instead of on the sidelines. And these bodies need to have the lived experience that we are trying to cultivate in the, in the environment. So to help us, uh, uh, this will help us to move this agenda of creating belonging, inclusion, and safety for everyone on all our campuses across um, our university. So here's another opportunity for your participation. Can you comment on how confident you personally feel to, with your ability to fill the gaps amongst all the different individuals or groups that you think are excluded in the learning and teaching environment. So basically what I'm asking you, if you think the person that you represent today is able to account for everything that's missing in the teaching and learning environment. Pretty much people are not confident, uh, Dr. Mulling, unsure how to fill the gaps, mm -hmm. not, feeling, mm -hmm. not feeling confident in how to do that. Definitely not. A lot of definitely not. <laughs> people are pretty confident that they're not confident. <laughs> yeah, low confidence. Yeah. Okay, and so thank you so much for that, because that is why we actually need the people with lived experience in positions where, you know, you know, we can all contribute because it is quite dangerous for those of us um, with limited experience to try and fill all those gaps. But we cannot say, well, we, we don't have the confidence, so we cannot do anything. So until we have full representation, we do the best we can with what we have. So I invite you to consider some of Memorial University's teaching and learning assets. We're complete rock stars here. Um, so on full display for these two days is our award-winning Center for Integrative Teaching and Learning, where the sky is the limit in what they can help you to achieve in your teaching and learning pedagogies. Believe me, I used to be knocking on their doors at all time, ask them to create avatar, you know, and everything in between. We also have faculty here that have won every teaching award imaginable, Pan University and internationally, including President's Award for Teaching, um, Supervision, and the 3M Awards. So here, we also engage in community service learning, student-centered learning, decolonized learning, including land-based learning, partnering with community, as well as small business. So we do some really amazing things. So here is what some of the things that I do. I'm just gonna share with you now some of the things that I do and would encourage you to consider some of these things as well on your journey to transforming education. First, let go control. 
let go control of the classroom. And I say this, not to um, encourage you to create chaos, although chaos can be nice sometimes in the classroom, is that when you let go control of how things are structured, how you're the only person that gets to make all the important decisions about what the learning and teaching environment looks like, what comes into it, the literature, if you have guest speakers, the assignments, it means that students are just being led. They're just empty vessels, they're just being led. And I know it is tricky to let go of control because we've been taught that you actually need to control what happens in your learning and teaching environment. Otherwise, you're not a competent teacher, right? Um, but just consider if you're not able to let go of control, what's the hindrance there? Is it fear? You know, are you going up for tenure and promotion and you're afraid that, you know, maybe you will get poor reports from students and those kinds of things. But the other thing I want to encourage you is that don't be afraid to let students be uncomfortable. Um, they will be fine. You know, try to avoid overprotecting them, encouraging them to regurgitate what you've been introducing them to or mimic you or color inside the lines, as we say. So how do we do that? Again, I'll share with you how I do that. This is just one way. Um, so normally I use the first entire class or section a segment. If it's a one hour, if it's a three hour, I use the entire time to discuss the teaching and learning methods, the benefits and the importance to learners um, that I will, that of the approach that I will bring. Um, the reasons for implementing these strategies and, the, and, and lay the foundation for how the class will unfold generally. Now, this is because we need to begin with something, but later, you know, when the, when the environment is created, uh, students can adjust according to their needs. During this time, uh, um, learners are encouraged to form small groups, consider term projects, and start getting a feel of what student-centered learning is, what community service learning might be, and you know, work out some of their anxiety about that. Often, um, an assignment, oops, often an assignment is due in the second class uh, where learners are asked to reflect on their learning styles and needs, propose content that they think are important for the class, decide on guest speakers that they want to have in, uh, talk about their past experiences with group work, um, and expectations of themselves, of their colleagues, and myself. And two major comments service every time without fail. Your turn to, um, to participate. What do you think? Some of the comments are when I say we're going to do student centered learning and community service learning and you know you're going to be going out there and work with the community and you're going to manage the classroom yourself and I'm just going to be along um, to support you. What do you think some of the comments are. Oops. Great motivation for students, a complaint I had to teach myself. <laughs> you may not get pushback, student hesitance. How do I do that? Anxiety, likely something related to grades. How will I get my marks? How will it be marked? Mm -hmm. from a student, I don't know where to, this is from a student. I don't know where to start. Surprise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I've heard all of those. Absolutely. Thank you so much. This is so real for me. The two top responses I've had is one, will I learn or how will I learn? Will I learn anything? And the other thing is, why do I have to teach myself? Basically, what is the teacher going to be doing and everything in between? I'm afraid of failing. I don't want other people to know what's happening for me. This sounds confusing. I'm not sure that I want to do this and things like that. So there's a lot of discomfort with the shifting of the teacher's roles and the concerns, you know, around 
specifically the course content. Normally, this method is different from students' experiences across post-secondary education. And this creates further anxiety. During this time, I offer encouragement. I explain how we can work together to help them to achieve their learning goals while talking, while taking control of their own education. This is an opportunity for students to have their own agency, right? So here, I'll, again, I'll just share with you how I do this. So I create opportunities for learner to, learners to explore and exercise their own agency uh, self directed and be self directed. So I, I, you know, just basically let them choose and design the process of how to complete projects. You can do this in math, stats, biology, social work, pharmacy with support um, while you support them, you know, instead of maybe giving tests or exams. For large classes, and I know a lot of people say, well, what, what do we do about large classes? You can actually do things like um, group work. Actually, I'll come to that in a little bit later. But, you know, when you're thinking about how do I grade something like this, you know, you can actually have peer grading here at um, SIDL. They will assist you in de de uh, designing peer grading opportunities. They'll walk you through the steps and all those things are available to you if you're interested. Now, peer grading is critiqued for some of its limitations, so it's not really good for everything, but it works well for some things. So ensure that course content reflects the learner population. It's really important that people in the classroom see themselves reflected in that. So ask for suggestions of content and be prepared to include that in the syllabus. That is why the first class I introduce when I introduce what the student centered learning is, decolonized learning is, but I also there's an assignment that to do the second class because at, by month's policy, you need to find, finalize your your syllabus by your second class. So if students bring, you know, um, bring back their assignments by the second class, I very quickly um, can integrate some of what their suggestions are in the syllabus and get it back to them. Be present, be a guide, a coach, a mentor, a complete rock star, and model what you want the students to do. If you're afraid, if you are encroaching on them, uh, babysitting them, spoon feeding them, they'll expect that, and the self-directed learning will go through the window. So here, there's an opportunity to involve learners in every aspect of the class. Um, Ask them what they want and give them options beyond the standard group work or lab. Just really ask them what they want. You'd be surprised of some of the creative ideas that they come up with. Um, you can also have students organize and facilitate group discussions and seminars. This is a fabulous way to help students to learn how to begin to um, uh, chair meetings um, and conduct themselves in this kind of way. Where possible, circulate amongst learners. Even online, you can do that. You can pop in class, you can pop in rooms that are available, but on the ground, just sit amongst the students. Um, listen to what they're saying. Offer suggestions as they're speaking in their groups um, and uh, help them to tease out things so that they think deeper and critically. Above all, show confidence and heap on the praise. Do not. And at the same time, do not allow them to trap you into the old status quo, because one of the things is human nature for all of us, right? When something shows up for us and it's new, we really don't want to have, for the most part, we don't want to have anything to do with it. We want to go back to what's normal for us and what we're used to. So a lot of times students will say, just tell me what to do. One of the critiques I get consistently from students is that, I never answer a question. And that's very deliberate because I'm intending for students to think. So I will turn the question back to them. What do you think about that? Um, or I'll tease it out a bit more. And so I experience students as being quite frustrated with that, but I'm okay. I feel okay with them feeling frustrated because that's an opportunity for them to push themselves to learn. I don't use PowerPoints. I find it's distracting. Um, as soon as the PowerPoint goes up, the student's head go down, they start writing, and I'm not sure they're actually hearing anything that I'm saying. But I make sure that the content of the course is 
presented in such a way that most students have said that they retain a lot of the information, whereas if they were, if I was lecturing, um, they probably wouldn't have rem remembered half of it. So um, I also avoid lecturing for a full class. I um, punctuate, and the literature tells us this as well, is that you punctuate whatever you're doing, um, you know, with lots of interactive type things, you know, ask questions, um, do small breakout rooms, and things like that. But the thing that I want to encourage you to remember is that it takes courage, whatever you want to call it, courage, fortitude, tenacity, grit, along with a small circle of people who you can completely be vulnerable with and who will circle around you and hold you up when you experience backlash. Because for some of us, it's not a matter of if, but when, but rather when oppositions will surface. And sometimes when it comes, it's quite, it feels quite lethal, um, not only from students, but also from administrators. Although, you know, right across the world, administrators are saying, you know, we want you to do student-centered learning and get into the community. When you actually do that and students are upset, you know, administrators are nervous about, are we going to lose students? Does that mean we're going to lose money? And those kinds of things. If students are unhappy, we need to fix things right away. And sometimes you may not get the, the support you need from administrators, but you find your colleagues, you find people who are doing similar work that you can collaborate with and talk with and get your small circle, because those are the ones that's going to bring you through. Be prepared to work. Um, let me see. Yep. Yeah. Be prepared to work harder than you've worked when you integrate decolonized learning, student-centered learning, community service learning, because there's no cookie cutter approach. There is no one size fits all. And you just need to be aware and be helpful and be supportive and um, be there for learners. Um, but I can say to you that nothing feels better for me as a facilitator, when at the end of the course, I see the same students who were saying, well, I'm not sure about this, light up. And when we do our final large class reflection, how, you know, we, we write, you know, we, I, you, normally we put things up along the walls and people write on them. We probably have to do that virtually now, right in your own rooms, but just have people reflect on what their experiences has been tremendous, tremendous difference in people's um, uh, acceptance or gratitude for the kind of learning that they've learning and teaching opportunities that they're experiencing. And, you know, yeah, so for me, there's nothing, nothing better. So I'll leave you with this. Um, if there is, I, I'll leave you with this for now. Um, no, sorry. So before you go into the large group discussion, the, the small group discussion, just want to say to you that it might sound a little, a little bit off to actually conduct a class like that because students do critique, as you have said, they critique about the, the, um, dysfunctionality and those kinds of things. But what I remind students is that you're actually in charge here. So if you feel dysfunction, Let's figure out how you can make it different and how we can work for you. But always put it back on students and how you can support them to get what they want. All right. So I'll leave that there now. And I'm just wondering if you have some questions before we go into this small group. We do have a couple of questions in the chat, uh, Dr. Okay. Mullins. Uh, uh, John Craig had, has asked, could you elaborate regarding CITL help with filling gaps? Oh, oh, absolutely. So, you know, CITL is quite a little bit of a gold mine for, um, I, and I think um, maybe a lot of us don't quite know. So I've, <clears throat> excuse me, I've worked with CITL to help me de, um, design learning up, learning and teaching opportunities for students. They, uh, you know, make an appointment with you, they bring you over or they'll come inside your classroom, they will do some observing and, and ask you questions and 
um, give you, you know, make suggestions about what you can do. Um, they have tons and tons of resources on everything imaginable about teaching and learning. They also have, well, when I, I'm not sure, but I, I, well, they used to have a lot of teaching and learning courses. I took quite a number of them um, in my very early years and then did some touch-ups um, in later years about effectiveness of teaching, um, lots of literature around community service learning or student-centered learning or um, designing um, grading rubric, um, all those, everything in between. I, I just, I mean, the, the amount of resources that they have in this little hub, you will not, you will not be disappointed. Um, my recommendation is if you're thinking about doing anything that you haven't done before, if you're thinking about something and you don't even know what, just make an appointment with somebody and they'll help you tease out lots of um, the kinks um, and they'll help you to evaluate it as well once you've put it into practice. Thank you that, for that, Dolores. Couldn't have done that better myself, but uh, <laughs> yeah. it's certainly, uh, we, we do have every, uh, everything to meet all the instructional needs that anybody uh, can imagine. So please come see us with any question you have. Um, the second question here uh, from Dr. Jenna Rosales, uh, what advice do you have for educators worried that letting students choose the subjects will lead to more work for the instructor? Student choice may feel like we are being pushed outside the domain of our expertise and we might feel pressed for time. You know what? Absolutely, it is more work. It is more work. I found it's more work, but I have found over time. So when I start out the first session, it's overwhelming. It's like, oh my goodness, the students are emailing for everything every day, every minute, they're emailing for something. But I also manage my course. I've done this for years, hybrid wise. So I've always had um, a course shell, whether or not the course is online or in person, well, if whether it's um, on campus, I've always had a course shell, and that was a way that I communicated with students regularly, and they could communicate it with each other too. So I'd set up, you know, groups on there, discussion folders, you know, how that work. Um, and so, you know, they could go on and ask any question at any time. There'd be a folder for questions, and I'd have a folder where I provide information and instructions. So that lessened the work for me and uh, you know i'd repeat it in class and then i would point them there to and if, you know inevitably five people will say well what about this and i'd say well it's posted already um to reduce the workload but i did find that th there is there definitely is an uptake in um you know the time you you spend where i found the reduction in um, my time in the classroom, for example, is with the grading, especially if I implemented self grading and I did that a fair bit. And believe me, students are harder on themselves for the most part than you are harder on them. Um, so, you know, we work together in that way. So whereas prior I'd spent hours and hours grading, I found that the time that I spent um, designing the grading rubric with students <clears throat> help to lessen the grading. So it's sort of something sort of balance out. What was the other part of the question? I think I forgot the last part. Yeah, just commenting that uh, student choice may feel like we are being pushed outside the domain of our expertise and we might feel pressed for time. So it's related to the question. Yeah, okay. Uh, that, yeah. Yeah, all good. My my notes. Um, I thought I, I learned a great deal from from your talk, Dr. Mullins, and and uh, I guess my question deals with like, um, what if I had like uh, like often with my discussion classes, I give them the questions in advance, like through reading guidelines, so they know what to focus on, so they don't feel overwhelmed by the amount of reading. Mm -hmm. So and it's a bit of a strategy to develop the reading skills. But I'm wondering also if I, uh, as an idea, to give them the opportunity for them to 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 design their own questions, like maybe that that would be a way to 
um, uh, you know, give voice to students who who don't have the same perspective as me. Maybe come from, mm -hmm. you know, like that. You know, the idea of kind of reaching students who are not part of um, the dominant mm -hmm. group or whatever. But but I think in that maybe would that work? Or like in some like would that work in a second year class and a first year class? Or is that more for a senior class? Like absolutely. I yeah. I think these are applicable everywhere. And yeah. What you can do is because at the beginning they they tend to be nervous, the yeah. first time or the first week you can sort of like offer them some guided questions so that they get a sense of, they get a a feel of a little bit more comfort, and then by yeah. third class, you know you launch them basically, okay. you know, sure. or second okay. class you can maybe give them one question and then they can come up with two, yeah, and then after that it's it's you know it's their their domain. Excellent idea. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so we've had a number of different groups. We don't have all the time in order to have hear everyone, but we wonder if um, you know two groups or two people could share something that they came up with or what your experience was just doing this. Um, let me, because I know I, let me see who, um, was there a group one? We have them in groups, right? How about group one? That's the quickest number. What did you come up with group one? Who was in group one, please? Um, uh, not sure what, what number they, uh, Oh, we don't know. Yeah, okay. So that's yeah. okay. So anyone can speak then. Um, oh, apparently we do know, and I was in group one. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was just don't quit. Thanks to Stacy, who is at CITL, so she really knows how these things work. Um, yeah, I think, well, as I put in the chat, I think partly we're just really inspired by you and, and this talk. Uh, but we had an interesting group, someone from CITL, myself, I'm a professor in chemistry, and uh, someone from the public service, a social worker who now, I forget the thing, but governs an area of uh, community health uh, organization within Eastern Health. And uh, so between the three of us, we could really picture a scenario where your students could really um, do this kind of exploration in the workplace that Annette had. And um, I think one thing that I brought to the table was uh, something that you, you also bring to the table is this, this experience of seniority so that we can just do these things without huge consequences. Um, and also for me, ungrading has really brought, <laughs> sounding a bit of a broken record, but ungrading has really uh, been an asset in terms of getting students to not push back so much of these, these exploratory things. Um, and of course, Stacy with her instructional design experience. I think those three things could really, you know, the workplace and the experience and the seniority could really come together and, um, and uh, make this kind of a, a scenario possible and, and fruitful. Thank you so much, Erica. <laughs> um, another group, maybe group six. I think that's me. I think I was uh, nominated to discuss for our group. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, John. Uh, Craig. Um, okay. Uh, so we talked about incorporating um, lessons on time management into our classes. We talked about um, different learning styles within the classroom and some students grasped the remote environment really easily and some needed a little bit more guidance. So providing a schedule for them would be helpful. Uh, we talked about increasing um, the elements of interaction. So um, a couple of the people in my group uh, were including tutorials as part of their work um, to kind of increase that um, smaller group feel with the students. Uh, we talked about um, um, one of my group members, actually a professor in chemistry, um, talked about how where the professors are not necessarily the, um, the lab instructors, obviously, um, mm -hmm. the professors would often go to the labs just to meet the students just to have that level of interaction with them that they weren't getting um, in a remote environment. Uh, we talked mm -hmm. about including weekly lists 
so that students can stay on top of the work, not fall behind and still feel that connection as a form of interaction. And we talked about availing of the resources that are offered in our community, um, specifically the a Academic Success Center um, mm -hmm. as a, a way to keep everybody connected with each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. Okay, so we have a little bit of time. So I'm wondering if you want to ask if there are any questions you want to ask or any comments. Maybe we can just have a little bit of a discussion as we clue up and go out with a high energy. Oh, great. There are questions. Dr. Myrick. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Anne. Thank you. Just a sec. There we go. Hi there. Nice to meet you, Dolores. Um, and nice to meet you too, Anne. <laughs> and thank you for that. Um, I guess it, it's more a comment than a question, but um, as you were talking, I was thinking about, and you know, all day yesterday, I was thinking about how different our institutions are, right? I'm at UPEI. This is not to dis UPEI necessarily. Um, but I think that, that, you know, the recognition of the institutional limitations um, or constraints on so much of what we want to do. And, and um, so, it, so I'm thinking about things like access, right? And, and this real kind of, of um, interest that I have, because I've, I've given up the myth of control completely, right? Um, that moving into the future and how to sort of, of create classrooms that are very different than the ones that I was doing in fall 2019 and before, um, and the institutional limitations on that, right? We don't have the technologies, obviously PEI like Newfoundland has crappy internet access in all sorts of places. Um, and so just how to, to, how to sort of, of, of shift what seems to be an institutional just lack of investment and frankly, lack of interest sometimes in rethinking how universities work, right? And I think mm -hmm. heading into a period of, of immense excitement for rethinking what a university is and what a university does, and I'm not mm -hmm. sure we're dragging a lot of administrators excluded, you excluded, right? But I'm not sure we're dragging a lot of administrators along with us and frankly, probably some of our colleagues also, right? Like the ones who aren't necessarily here having this conversation right now. Um, and I also want to recognize the the so much of this kind of rethinking work can be done by people from secure positions, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so if, I, I say this all the time at my university, if the full professors aren't talking, who do you expect to be talking, right? I'm not mm -hmm. on precarious labor and people whose, yeah, whose sort of connection to the institution is way more precarious than mine is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's not yeah. supposed to be the downer that it sounds like, but it's just... <laughs> Thank you for the question. Well, you know, it's funny because I've taken this approach to teaching and learning, I think, 2010. I came in 2009 and I thought this prior to coming, but I was scared off when I was doing per course. I was really scared off by students and administrators reactions. So when I got here, I thought, mm, maybe I'm not going to do it. It didn't take me long to say, you know what? Let's just see what happens. And every single year, it, I, I was sort of like a little bit cautious about what students would say. And without fail, every year they'd be like, she didn't teach us anything. <laughs> and I'm like, great. I wasn't meant to teach you anything. You were meant to help yourself learn. You know, so yeah, I get it about if you don't have the security, it's, it's a challenge and it's scary. 